now shifting our focus onto a topic that's incredibly relevant in today's digital first world. Winning in a competitive online ecosystem with D2C brand strategies. Isn't it interesting? So today we'll understand how D2C model has actually transformed the brands, connecting with customers, allowing them a personalized experience, and also creating new challenges in standing out in a very crowded digital space. So today we have a group of incredible panelists who are ready to share their insights with us. So let's welcome our distinguished panelists with a wealth of experience in navigating the complexities of our D2C landscape. Please put a huge round of applause for all our wonderful panelists whom I'm going to introduce one by one. So let me introduce the panelist members. Mr. Arjun Rastogi, who is a co-founder of Nagan. Please put a huge round of applause, everyone. Welcome, sir, on stage. Okay, so our second panelist member, Mr. Chirak Kenya, who is a co-founder and CEO of Urban Platter. Welcome on stage, sir. I would like to take a pause. I'll quickly introduce our topic that is very relevant in today's digital first world. Our topic is winning in a competitive online ecosystem with D2C brand strategies. Isn't it amazing how D2C model has actually transformed the way brands connect with each other, allowing them a personalized experience and also creating new challenges in the crowded digital space. So today we have a group of incredible panelists who have successfully navigated these challenges. And I would now like to invite them on stage. So our first panel member is Mr. Arjun Rastogi, who is a co-founder for Nagan Brand. Thank you, sir. Please join us on stage. Our second panel member is Mr. Chirak, sorry, I'm so sorry, Mr. Chirak Kenya who is a co-founder and CEO of Urban Platter. Please give a huge round of applause for him. Our third panelist member is Mr. Udit Toshniwal, who is a co-founder and CEO of the Pant Project. Give a huge round of applause once again. Welcome, sir. Our fourth panelist member, Mr. Sujata Biswas, sorry, Ms. Sujata Biswas, co-founder of Suta Brand. So sorry, ma'am. Please welcome on stage. Ma'am, you look very pretty. Our fifth panel member is Mr. Mr. Prateek Mukherjee, who is the head of business, Beauty House of Masaba. Please welcome on stage. Guide us through this exciting and exciting and insightful presentation and conversation. We have a fantastic moderator with us, who is Mr. Arjun Vedya, co-founder V3 Ventures. Please put your hands together for him. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for a collective round of applause for our distinguished moderator and panelist. And now, without further ado, I will hand over the discussion to our moderator, Mr. Arjun Vedya. Over to you, sir. Okay, so small, close group, so we're going to try to keep this fun and conversational. Um, I think all of the panelists, actually, I have spent time with in the past um, and uh, discussed their businesses, their journeys, uh, and how they have got to where they've gotten. Um, I think over the last six, seven years as the D2C space has been evolving. We've moved from a time where there were few brands and few customers 
to a much larger market size where there are lots and lots of customers, but with that, there are also lots and lots of brands, right? And so in today's discussion, we're actually going to focus on how to cut through the clutter, right? And we're going to focus on various aspects of how you cut through this clutter and how you succeed and win in a competitive online environment, right? So um, I'm not going to have the panelists introduce themselves because they all run quite famous brands as well. But one by one, I'm going to sort of pick their brains on this specific topic, right? So the first question I'll start with is a more generalized question. Um, and for each of them operating in different spaces, whether it's food, apparel, beauty, personal care, these are probably the most competitive spaces in D2C. And so I'm going to have each of them first start the conversation with talking about what's happened in the last few years in your specific segment of food uh, or of apparel or of beauty um, in terms of competition. How has it heightened and how as a brand are you looking at sort of navigating this? So I'll start with Arjun maybe in the sauces space. Tell us what's happened over the last few years. We've seen um, after you guys launch hot sauce, many other hot sauce brand, brands come about. But just in the general um, sources space as well. What's happening right now and how are we trying to cut through the clutter? Thanks, Arjun. So, um, so we've, we've actually seen like a couple of different things play out over the last few years. I think when we first started, um, we were really keen to understand like what is happening in the market already. I think it was largely clustered around like a few brands doing like a whole bunch of products. Um, and it was largely very similar stuff that they're doing. So it's like a lot of people making the same 8, 10 products with different packaging, different color branding and stuff like that. That was pretty much it. Um, I think the way we sort of broke it down was um, if, if there's so many people looking to make what they know people will buy, can we try and make something that we think people will love? Right? Like, so I think we tried to do something that was a little different. I think in some cases it's going to work out in our favor and some not so much in the sense that it's not like we're making tandoori sauce and like, you know, butter chicken sauce or whatever the case is. The idea is to kind of make something different and unique. Now that helps you stand out in the sense that it's a little different. It's not been sort of seen before, but it sort of is working against you in the sense that in food, people sort of want to go with what they're familiar with, what they understand. So a large part of what's been opening up for us of late is sort of like, as we ramp up trials and sampling, whether that's happening in events or Horeca, like that's the type of stuff that really helps for us. Um, but yeah, like I think just like looking to break through what people are giving you already doesn't mean that like you have to do something necessarily different. Different can be bad also, but the idea is to try and focus on flavor and see where, you know. Okay, let me ask you a tougher question. Yeah. Uh, because you skirted that question a little bit. <laughs> so there are lots of brands that have come up in the last couple of years that look very, very, very similar to your brand in terms of packaging, in terms of communication, in terms of storytelling. What do you do in such a circumstance? Um, specifically in hot sauce, I sort of welcome it. It's like, okay, cool, if I've been spending years trying to do um, education for people, it's like, come, why don't you come in and spend your money also educating the customers? It shouldn't just be me for you to stroll in later. Um, but jokes aside, yeah, I mean, like what you can kind of do is sort of give people different ways to experience it. Like uh, there's a lot of the, like you said, like a lot of the same products sort of coming through. Like I think the idea is how can you differentiate in terms of like advertising promotion is one thing, but there's a lot of like marketing collaboration that happens over there. That's where the difference comes in is just like how much can you do it on other channels. So D2C is like really good for what it is, but like I think the real magic in D2C also comes when you're able to support it with marketplaces, with retail um, and with Horeca and all this other stuff as well. So I'll, I'll move the qu the... Uh, question to Chirag Bhai now. Um, obviously, Chirag Bhai and I have met about two and a half, three years ago, but I first discovered Urban Platter actually in the pandemic when all of us were stuck at home and uh, we didn't have access to Swiggy Zomato as much at that time, but we wanted these gourmet foods and everyone had become a home master chef, etc. And that's the time that everyone found out about Urban Platter, right? Because you were the only one selling oat milk and goju chang and all of those sort of nuanced foreign ingredients. And, and then um, with time, I think as the world opened, uh, these ingredients and your uniqueness of being the only one to sell these ingredients uh, sort of went away, right? Because there were other people who came about, saw the opportunity, saw the amount of growth that Urban Platter got. Uh, yours is a business that has 
hundreds of SKUs across different categories, different kinds of food. And there may not be businesses that have that, that level of depth across cuisines. But I've seen now sort of lots of brands come out that hit certain parts of it. Right? There'll be a brand selling Korean cuisine and a brand selling Western spices, et cetera, all of that. In this ecosystem, um, as a platform brand, I would say, how do we look at cutting through the clutter? How do we look at innovating? How do we look at still being the first one to launch a new product in our country? How do we manage it with supply chain? Talk to us about all of that. So great observation. Uh, <clears throat> so our uh, journey of building this company, Arjun, has been sort of, uh, if I look at a very macro level, we've been doing, we've been having three phases. The first one was basically making the right quality of products, the right assortment available. The second one was more so about refinement. And third so was more, the third which I believe we are going through right now is more about, you know, going deeper into cuisine assortment, uh, building the entire basket as a whole and filling in the gaps of a lot of ingredients that necessarily don't sell in isolation, but sell as a basket uh, when it comes to a cuisine. So, you know, just to iterate your point, uh, one of the fastest growing uh, segments for us is the Korean food cuisine in whole. Not just Korean ingredients or Korean ramen. That's one part of Korean cuisine. But when we go deeper and look into the sauces, condiments, staples, and break it down into actionable parts, it actually becomes a very big basket. And consumers, in my opinion, uh, and we've experienced this through uh, what we do, is consumers basically come to you for uh, your specialization. Uh, I think be it hot sauces, people would probably want to go to Nugget because they really specialize in what they do and they're really good at what they do and that's what becomes their brand and by extension the consumer anticipation out of them. What we do is we specialize in cuisine and gourmet ingredients and by the virtue of that, a lot of consumers think by default of searching for an urban platter product for a particular ingredient when they want it because in general, the anticipation is that there, are, there is a very fair chance that if it's a specialty ingredient, we may carry it. And in most cases, we do. So what we essentially also do is, I think we unleash the power, the true potential of D2C is actually uh, interacting with your consumer. A lot of businesses actually uh, build for customers who are not necessarily consumers. I think there's a fundamental difference in that. Uh, we've always built for the consumers. We've always kept a dialogue open with the consumers. There is always an after sales, communication, feedback, uh, recipe exchange happening with the consumer through which we get a lot of feedback. We also get a lot of curiosity with the consumers about whatever anxiety they have with the product, about how to use it, uh, build use cases for it. And this leads to a lot of simplification over a period of time. A lot of times, in fact, this is happening a lot lately is that our product strategy is driven by consumer feedback. When a consumer buys three products, they often write to us stating that, you know, I was anticipating that you would have X or Y, but I couldn't find it. And could you get it for me? And when we have enough uh, proof cases of such a feedback coming, we obviously put our supply chain team onto the job and, you know, see the viability of the product and try to get it in our portfolio. So I think by specializing in a certain forte, and uh, building consumer anticipation, a lot of your actions will be decided by consumer feedback. And by actioning on that, we continue to refine what we do. So it's a very mature catalog uh, that, you know, through our initiation, through consumer feedback, and through sort of intentionally choosing to specialize in subject matter of cuisines and filling in the gaps at a cuisine level, we've sort of built and will continue to strengthen over a period of time. And that's what we want to build Urban Platter around. You know, we want to be a very cuisine, very gourmet, very health ingredient centric brand. So in all of those cohorts, we use the same modus operandi and refine our catalog, refine our availability. And that's why most consumers actually want to buy from us or our brand directly because of, as a virtue of that basket experience. And, and just maybe a follow up question to that. You have to be the first to launch a new ingredient, yeah. right? Or new product or... Tell us about that journey of supply chain. You see something trending in the US, you go, travel, source it. How do you get it first every single time? I think... Uh, I, I've been asked this question a lot of times. I think it's a combination of... 
just being uh, alert and available to international trends, uh, being out there, traveling, experiencing cuisine and trends for yourself. Uh, a lot of people also, uh, you know, I, I come from, my, my past experience has been in the data industry. So I've learned that beyond a point, data starts telling you what you want to listen. So you have to segregate between trends and practical approaches using common sense in your current market. So what necessarily may work in other geographies may not necessarily end up working in this market. So I think one should look into the reasons why something is doing well in a particular market, identify a trend, see that the root causes of the trend are probably relevant in a market like ours and build it up from there. And secondly, uh, one, one thing that has worked very well for us is exceptional relationships with our suppliers. I think if you have great suppliers, if you work with them directly and you have good relationships with them, in most cases, they are the ones initiating that, look, something that I do is doing well in a particular market. Do you want to have a look at it or no? And uh, at any given point of time, if you come to our office, you will see probably about 250 to 300 products waiting to be sampled, waiting to be tried out, waiting to be evaluated. So, you know, we have a very long pipeline of actionable things and products and trends that we keep reviewing all the time. What we do is we, we've built an internal uh, knowledge base, uh, understanding that, look, this is doing well in this market at this point of time. Maybe a year later, this will make sense in our country. Uh, and we keep improvising on knowledge at a very daily basis, you know. So we, we honestly use a combination of international trends, networking, uh, good vendor relationships, and lastly, using a, you know, some sort of a internal knowledge base to drive all the innovation we do. Correct. Thank you so much for that one. We're going to move to Udit. Um, very few people know this, but I know Udit since he was like three, three years old or something like that. Uh, so we are good friends for a very, very long time. Uh, and Udit has now become very famous. Udit is all over Instagram on the Pan Project ads. You can see him on Instagram. I see him like five times a day. Um, look, your family comes from deep expertise in the textile domain for many, many years now. Um, your brother and you went off to start a D2C brand uh, focused initially on customized pant delivery, right? Like go online, get a customized pant delivered exactly to your fit, tailored to your fit. That was first in the market, took a lot of time to develop that um, technology, expertise, and the ability to deliver that. And then as the brand has gone along, uh, you guys are also doing um, ready-to-wear products as well. So walk us through the journey of coming up with something so unique, so disruptive, scaling that, and then eventually going into larger TAM category or larger market category. Thanks, Arjun, for that question. And um, I mean, you've seen the journey as well. For us, uh, starting a D2C brand focused on a specific product, right? Like where the pant project, right now we do just bottom wear. That allowed us to really go deep into the product and uh, also like research uh, fit. I think in apparel, uh, fit is such an important aspect of getting the product market fit right as well. And so we were able to do that in early stage thanks to custom made. Once we had a product market fit, then we were able to scale it up through ready to wear. But getting all of the size data, through custom made was like the integral uh, like strategy part of it. And that also helped us like break the clutter on the internet through our communication. So I think for us, like understanding that product and marketing your product through the communication was like key to it. And that coherent, consistent journey is what really got a customer to like buy in on the first time on the internet. I think uh, for us, what we saw was that the heritage brands hadn't done anything new uh, in the past few decades across India. They were still relying on their old stories, uh, the complete man, the same story. For us, we really made the product the hero, and at the same time, as uh, you were saying over here, Chirag, like really understood the consumer. So the con consumer had changed, his body type had changed. He was often purchasing p pants or pro apparel from whenever he would travel abroad, and now he wanted to, especially in the pandemic, 
purchase it in India. There's been a huge surge. I mean, Arjun, you've been at the helm of it right now in India to see the whole like made in India, buy in India, and consume Indian brands. So I think that people also wanted to connect to that brand story. So I think it was a combination of really understanding our consumer, understanding fit over there, and we managed to do that through custom made and through that like personalized journey. And then being able to like scale up that for product market fit, that really was our success story, while differentiating ourselves from the heritage brand that hadn't been able to like really listen to what the consumers wanted. And then why go into non-customized? So once you've reached a certain like understanding of the market, obviously scale is really important to be able to become like a relevant brand and to be able to reach a wider audience. And we realized that through the data that we had on fit, we were able to like also scale it in certain SKUs by holding the right inventory uh, in it and make sure that it was accessible on a quicker lead time. Like uh, for us, when we were doing a custom made journey, it was around like uh, 10 days to like two weeks over there. Whereas everyone is pretty impatient, especially like men, they realize way too last minute that they need a new pant. And so I think to be able to service those customers as well as to be able to service our repeat customers on loyalty. So often someone may get like an individual pant custom made the first time and then come back and like do repeat orders. Or maybe they want to try out the pant at a retail store the first time and they may get like um, a ready to wear pant just to try the sizing and get their size right, but then do free alterations or get their pant altered and then go into custom made. So we've realized that like the journey isn't like horizontal or isn't, isn't like linear, but like custom made and ready to wear both go hand in hand. It's just got different use cases based on balancing like whether someone needs it conveniently or someone needs like to be able to have like the perfect fit and get their fit right. So I think India as a market, and we can talk about this a little later, is a really diverse market. And being able to like as a brand cater to different needs in your very specific industry and apparel uh, or in your very specific industry uh, is like how you master and scale up your brand within that same space. Awesome. So I think I'll, I'll move the conversation now to Sujata. Uh, so Sujata and I met, I think in 2018, Love there was an event at the Google office and she was a speaker at that event and that time we were very small brands, so I was really impressed at the scale that Suta had reached. But I think more than that actually I was, I was excited to see a founder actually embody their brand, front face their brand and be their own brand ambassador. Today it's quite common. But you guys started doing this like seven, eight, ten years ago. Right? Now everyone's doing it. <laughs> like literally everyone's doing it. I've been telling people also to do it. But you guys started as the OGs and honestly that was a big differentiator. Right? Like customers truly connected with your brand and truly connected with what your brand stood for because they saw you and your sister embody all of that. Talk to us about why you did that. What people reacted to at that time. See, today it's very common, but at that time it was not common. So how did people react? Um, and then now that everyone's doing it and lots of people in the apparel space are doing it, uh, what do you think is the next step now for Suta to again cut through the clutter? Nice, good question. Uh, it's gonna make me think now what's next. But a uh, very simple answer to why I started doing that is because we wanted to save money. Uh, the kind of shoots we wanted to do, um, the costs were so high. It was almost like per product shoot was around 2,500, the kinds we wanted. And uh, me and my sister said, hey, let's just like take out your camera and I will just model headless and, you know, <laughs> not show my head. People will not take us seriously. We're founders and doing all of that. So we just started doing that to save money. That was the first thing. First headless, and then once my sister said, hey, you don't look bad, you know, like, put some kajal, put some lipstick, you know, just, just be presentable, I'll just click a good photo of yours. Then she started putting my photo, and then it, then we got a lot of comments, both positive and negative. One is like, you really just, literally like, literally it's just, you're in your house, you just woke up and just did the shoot, what is this, you know, like, because people are not used to seeing this. And they were always like models with properly ironed saris, my saris also were not ironed, most of the times the petticoats also didn't match properly, and we, we wanted to, we wanted to bring that concept that you don't have to wear a sari a particular way, don't have to wear matching petticoats, you can mix and match blouses, wear a top with it. But when we started then, we got a lot of love because a lot of young girls stopped wearing saris 
and uh, a, lot, a lot of people found it cumbersome because they always had to make it proper by putting a lot of pins and make it proper and always wearing heels, which I wanted to change. And from the start, I wore shoes with the saris. And uh, with a lot of positive, we got a lot of negative as well, comments as well. But also that made us stand out. I feel we just broke it right then and there. The clutter was broken <laughs> from the day one. And uh, people noticed. Even if they didn't shop, they noticed. And Saris, when we started, was not the thing at all for youngsters that they were buying, right? So uh, we also wanted to, we, honestly, when we started, we thought it would be a very, very small segment, very, very niche kind of people who really want to uh, own themselves up. They'd want to wear a sari and they didn't get a sari which was comfortable, they would buy from us. But we didn't know we are changing the whole narrative that it's going to be the thing. We didn't know when we started then. But now it's changed. Like if you saw the, the last Tap Tapsi Panu wore Suta, right? So we, she did a, we did a campaign together. And Tapsi was in Paris Olympics wearing only Suta with crop tops or blazers and stuff with shoes, boots, and running around in Paris. So she did all of that. That's what happens now, and people see it, and now they think, oh, this is always, it was always there. But no, it took us a lot of time to break it. So yeah, when we started, it was uh, uh, crazy. But also, there's a case study which is being written on Suta by uh, some IIM Ahmedabad professors, which talks about personal branding, like how we started back then for another different reason. But then we took it through. Like, we realized that customers are remembering us, remembering our face, and it has become a strategy now. And everyone's doing it because they want to be, the brand recall is much higher you're not using the same brand ambassador. Maybe the brand ambassador has gone somewhere else and they will think, oh, what is the brand? Oh, she, was she doing that? Was she doing that? That doesn't happen with us. At but least. here there's no way you'll do another brand. No, now, now. <laughs> by the way, I was approached by a lot of brands. I would not name the brand, but a very, very big competition of ours literally approached us saying, will you wear our saris? I'm like, no, absolutely not. <laughs> so yeah, that if a shoe happen. brand approaches you or something, you'll do it? I've done it. I've done, <laughs> yeah, I've done that, yeah. I will not mind doing that. But yeah, honestly, the next strategy is to also not become just the face. So now, when we did a different model, brought in a different model, there were questions like, are you sure that people will relate to that person? What if they stop buying you and buying the saris from you because you've changed the model? I said, no, let's try. And we keep bringing in different models in Suta as well. Um, I've seen the acceptance now that they're not asking again, hey, bring Sujata and Tanya back. And also because different age category, right? We've done it with models shoot with 60 plus women. We also do it with a younger girl, like a, maybe a 20, 21 year old uh, doing a sari, uh, wearing a sari. So we're trying to change that, bring it about. I'm still, me and my sister still come on shoots. We do the shoots, but it gets really hectic. We launch three collections a month, so <laughs> you can imagine. Awesome. We'll, we'll move to Prateek now. Uh, so look, personal care, Beauty personal care is uh, probably one of the fastest growing segments in D2C. Uh, I don't know if a lot of you know this, but about 7% of uh, retail in general in India is online, but 30% plus of BPC is sold online. And so that category has really made leaps and bounds in the digital ecosystem. But it is by far today, uh, I mean, maybe after fashion, the most cutthroat competition uh, in the ecosystem and the, cha the, the advantage fashion has is you can do different designs. You can have more skews. Here a uh, vitamin C serum is a vitamin C serum is a vitamin C serum, right? And so it's, it's hard to cut through that clutter especially when there are so many new brands coming out all the time. Right? I teach a D2C cohort, I know I get questions from our BPC founders all the time saying, how do we stand up against these people? Now you have obviously um, an in-house influencer celebrity, as you may call it, with a lot of reach. Uh, but there have to be other ways that your product and your brand cut through the clutter. So talk to us about how you think about this in this competitive environment. How does this brand come out and stand out? Uh, thanks, Arjun. So absolutely. In fact, uh, very recently, there was a Nika Red Sear report uh, which talks about uh, how India is globally the fastest growing BPC market double digit CAGR for the next four to five years. Uh, to put things into perspective, US, Southeast Asia, which were the OG uh, beauty cosmetics markets are now, of course, more matured markets growing three to five percent. India will grow at 10 percent plus. And the top two categories or subcategories are skincare and uh, makeup. Uh, 
uh, it's important to understand uh, what's happening uh, before uh, I come to how we think of differentiation. Uh, if you go back a decade or so, there were hardly three to four brands, if I, let's take the example of makeup. It's Lakme, it's Maybelline, it's Color Bar in North India, Revlon. So these four or five brands were there, at least the time we all grew up and were studying, etc. Uh, and in the last five years, the market has been flooded with new age insurgent brands, right? But if you look at brand recall, brand tracks, and now I, and I totally agree when uh, Arjun, you said the BPC co founder cohorts are asking uh, that question. If you look at a brand recall or a brand track, these are the same five brands which will come up in the quintessential consumer's mind. Uh, if you are asking them to name any top three or four makeup brands. Uh, what I see is, while a lot of new insurgent brands have come up, those have, for some good or bad reason, been product-led successes. All of them have maybe one hero skew, a bestseller, which is still 40 to 50% of their revenue on marketplaces, on website, on offline. And of course, some of them have cracked the L2 and the L3. But uh, in terms of brand building, I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done, and which is why a lot of brands have also come and just gone. Uh, in BPC, what's happening is every year, there will be two, three insurgent brands you will suddenly see everywhere, hear everywhere, but uh, next year, they are probably not there anymore uh, in that same space. I see it every day when, uh, so the brand we have is called Love Child by Masaba. Uh, and we are now in the offline uh, expansion spree in malls with kiosks, etc. In many places, we are replacing some of these brands which have just come up two, three years back. And that also made me wonder that uh, clearly the brand factor is probably still not there. And once your one or two hero products fizzle out, uh, consumers get bored, uh, some other brand takes that space on online as well as offline. So, so that's one thing, while there is a lot of clutter, brand building is the need of the hour. Uh, the second aspect is, uh, this double digit growth is happening because of a few factors. Uh, more women joining the workforce compared to the decade which I was talking about. Uh, more access to international and brands thanks to social media, thanks to the Nikas of the world and the Tiras of the world. It's easier for a Nars Cosmetics to enter India than it was ever before, right? Uh, and similarly for homegrown brands to list themselves or uh, create their own website. So there is a lot of access. There is, of course, with urbanization and smart cities, a lot of disposable income. Everybody wants to look confident, a better version of themselves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, the good news is brands which will be smart and will be able to differentiate themselves will make it to the consumer's hands. Gone are the days when a female consumer would only have one sunscreen, one serum, and one cleanser. They are now dressing up differently for each occasion or each time of the day. The breakfast look is different, the lunch look is different, and the dinner look is different. And hence, you need a different set of products. If you look at the, uh, you know, where they keep their makeup products, we do a lot of in-home research. Uh, earlier, what used to be a 10 product basket, now is easily a 20, 25 product basket. And the heartening part is, while there is a Lakme and a Maybelline, there is also a Love Child and there is also a Sugar Cosmetics, etc. So, so consumers are open and, you know, more uh, ready to experiment. Uh, and I think, therefore, differentiation is the key coming to uh, how I see things in this highly cluttered environment. Yes, a lipstick is a lipstick, a serum is a serum. What is working for us, at least at Love Child, and we will want to build on to that, is uh, this whole proposition-led approach to uh, launching products. A lipstick is a lipstick, but what or how we package it and present it to the consumers is making the difference. For example, we studied the US market and then some of the Indian brands. We saw that consumers are now going for minis, mini size lipsticks, uh, typically one gram, 1.5 gram. So we created a bundle of three, uh, packaged it with a signature masaba pouch, and we called it breakfast, lunch, dinner. Going back to the insight of uh, doing differently for different parts of the day. It's, it became an instant success on our website, on marketplaces. Consumers started asking when we went out of stock after the initial euphoria about, uh, you know, when is breakfast, lunch, dinner coming back in stock. 
our recent best seller it's nothing but a serum something which arjun just mentioned but it's a four in one serum and we call it skip everything we call it skip everything you don't need to separately buy a primer a moisturizer or a sunscreen this is a four in one and that has also touch wood broken through the charts so long story short what i'm realizing is consumers eventually buy into propositions and not products uh, brands which will survive this massive clutter in bpc and maybe fashion as well will have to differentiate at a brand level and at a product level as well uh, and it's a continuous journey a lot of my launches have not done well as well where we have not been able to crack this code uh, and coming back to our brand uh, clearly a lot of research went in and we realized that uh, Masaba Gupta is the biggest factor. Uh, she is the relatable face of the brand. She is out there. She does our own product videos, very similar to how Sujata was talking about it. Uh, very real. Uh, consumers are buying into products because it's Masaba who is applying it on herself, uh, swatching the lipstick, etc., etc. So I think uh, uh, our biggest differentiator is Masaba. On a lighter note, to a point that when the brand launched, our logo was 80% Love Child and 20% Masaba. now it's 60 40 40 we increase the length of masaba we decluttered the logo and that seems to be working so we will have to find more differentiators as we go along but uh, that's uh, our initial approach to scaling love child at this point yeah awesome so we've heard from all the founders in their specific niches about actually finding a way to cut through this clutter and cut through this competitive intensity that exists in the d2c ecosystem um and has come about in the last two or three years uh, i wanted to now switch gears and talk about a new subject that everyone's talking about right i think as the world has opened as offline has come back as our d2c brands are growing in size and scale each of us have to start thinking of this omni channel question right? and it's the fundamental question that everyone's talking about in the ecosystem everyone's thinking like how do our brands in d2c graduate to creating their own ebos to um going into offline distribution what's the right time how do you do it what's the play really right and so i'm going to spend time with each of the founders actually on the panel who all have had their various different gtm strategies on going offline on how they see that going forward and how they see it as a differentiator for their brand so maybe we'll start with arjun i think actually given the category of your brand pre existence of quick commerce you had to be offline in distribution then we had quick commerce come about and then you have recently cracked a massive deal with kfc where you will be selling they will be selling your sashes in their outlets as well so talk to us about how nagin thinks of offline um, and how that journey has evolved for you and why it's relevant even so um one of the things that i've always been envious of like beauty and apparel brands in general is this you can actually see the value of what you're doing right like i mean i can't communicate taste to you apart from maybe giving you an expression or something like that so it's always been one of like what is the value of this in your day and and so the idea was always like how do i show up in your general like is it a breakfast lunch dinner snack midnight snack like what is the angle there but like how it pertains to food in particular at least like the way we've broken it down is i think people need to try it at the at the core of it like only when they try it are they going to give you a better chance to actually go and get you know buy your product long term so for us a big part of this has been trying to do smaller packaging like you said um it it just really brings down sampling costs and you could sort of do it at a lot more touch points but sampling in retail getting into horeca sort of standing out and trying to get on the menu like for bombay you know rough sort of resident folks you may have come across sort of like sardar pawaji always had amul pawaji and that always fascinated me is just like the amount of butter that goes in they felt the need to write amul pawaji on the on the menu right so it's like that's a precious thing that's a beautifully precious thing so when we start seeing like okay nagin burger nagin pizza it just sort of like helps you out a little bit it gives some context to like what you're trying to do or like standing out a little bit so i think the idea for us is like every single channel gives you an opportunity to get trials in with your customers and i think over time that sort of builds into you know the fomo and all these other things like content and word of mouth and all this other stuff plays in 
but at the core of it, it's sort of like India is very much a try and buy country. And if that means we got to do it in retail and we got to do it in Horeca, we got to go to like co-working spaces and doing sessions. We got to maybe, you know, do, do something at like corporates, you know, where you engage with people. The idea is to try anything and everything that allows people to sample your product. Um, we don't have some of the lug, well, I'm going to say luxuries, though I'm sure might see some disagreement from Chirag on how to, you know, sort of break this down. But we don't have a massive portfolio. It's seven products. So the idea is you want to bring focus to every single one of them and what the value is. But you still get funny questions from people like, um, well, it's funny for me, but it's absolutely true for them, right? Where it's just like, what do I eat it with? And it's just like pretty much anything you want to eat it with. But that's not really an answer. So the idea is to show it. You can't just like, you know, like show, don't tell. And, and don't even show when you can get people to experience it. So there's like tiers of how you can get people to interact with your product and each different channel gives you a slightly different opportunity to do it. Awesome. Chirag Bhai, we have discussed offline multiple times. You have tried various different store formats as well from kiosks to um, EBOs to now looking at GTMD distribution as well. What's worked, what's not worked and how do you look at offline going forward? So, uh, for an online first company or an e-com first company for us, uh, uh, you know, the offline bit came in very organically and happened because most of the times we got retailers calling us and asking for products, you know, that's how uh, it panned out for us. I think if you're good at something, uh, there is a very good probability that every other channel will notice you and try to get a pie of you. So, and I, I, I say this very clearly every single time is as a brand, we've never paid any retailer in our journey a single Pasika listing fee. So, you know, just build a great product, build a, uh, be very consistent at it and, you know, everyone will open up their gates for you and be patient about it as well, you know. Uh, the other thing is every offline channel that we've been in and now we are in every channel. So I can say with a fair bit of confidence is that every channel will have its own nuances. What we've understood uh, for, for a brand like us is basically something like a GT works on pure play retailer recommendation. So if, if you can convince the retailer that you're good at something and they really like you, I think you're pretty sorted in uh, GT as a channel. Uh, modern trade for us has been a journey of representing our brand, showcasing it in the right format, uh, sampling, building better, uh, personalized connections with our consumers directly because we have, we have got our sales promoters and everyone over there. Uh, Horeka is again partnering with creators and being a part of their journey so requires a very personalized one-on-one -on -one approach and a little bit of belief system alignment with the creator and the brand. Every channel has its own nuances. And what we've also learned over a period of time is, since we have four of our company operated stores, is that uh, the consumer behavior and consumer anticipation in a brand store, in an EBO, is very different than what we've observed with any other channel partner out there. Our average order values, consumer expectation, consumer behavior in our stores is very, very different. Uh, you know, consumers typically uh, walk into your store with an, in, with an expectation that they will get a lot of answers, recommendations, and slightly differentiated, upgraded experience from other channels, you know, and we've tried to learn a lot from those behavioral touch points, deliver on that. Uh, in every offline channel, I've, my personal assessment is that you know, consumer uh, discovery for a relatively new brand is very emotion driven. If it comes through recommendation, it's bundled with good hospitality, it's bundled with good uh, sensory experiences, you got them for sure. And, uh, you know, one, one additional thing is, uh, uh, I mean, what works in our favor is, you know, having a slightly diverse portfolio of products always helps get a lot of consumer attention and spark curiosity. And once you can strike a conversation with a customer, I think uh, even if you don't convert them, at least if you got their attention, you got their curiosity, you can build a lot of uh, trust uh, basis, the response that is curated to them and thereafter at some point, you know, expect them to convert. I think offline for us is a great uh, sort of, a, uh, it, it just completes our e-com circle. So, We've seen a lot of our customers actually walk in into our stores and say that, look, I found this online, but I was hesitant to buy it. I need to understand the use cases. As, as you mentioned, 
you know, people do have simple questions all the time. How do, how do I eat it? How do I store it? How do I keep it? As much as we, uh, you know, as business owners know our products very well, the consumer questions and problems are very real. And uh, I think a generational shift is happening across India wherein the new breed of consumers sometimes even want to know very specific nuances of products that how do I store it? How much do I eat it in one go? Is it right for me? Is it right for my pet? Things like that only happen at offline channels where an official company representative can actually give a response, not necessarily a reply, but a well-researched response to the consumer. I think if you map out these touch points right, these journeys right, it, it leads to phenomenal consumer trust and love for you. And we see, like, I one trend I've seen consistently in our stores and modern traders, our average order values have consistently been growing and, and are probably, to my understanding, uh, the highest amongst what we do. Yeah. Awesome. We'll move to Udit now. Udit, a recent conversation with your brother, um, he mentioned that actually the CAC of acquiring a customer in an offline store is much lower than the online experience. So talk to us about Panprotect's journey with opening the various stores you have opened and how that's actually impacted the way you look at the further growth of the company and how to acquire customers at an efficient ROAS going forward. For sure. So I think for us it's been a really interesting journey because initially we were going to pre-pandemic start off as a offline model. But... It was a blessing in disguise that we actually landed up acquiring our first set of like thousands and now lakhs of customers digitally. And during this time, like the way it was uh, to run an ad and the way it was on Meta was a lot easier. Like I would say around like 2020, like COVID times, like those brands that grew during that time, it was just a different ball game on the internet. And now we have to get offline as well because like CACs have just been going exponentially high. But the reason for getting offline and why offline CACs are reducing, uh, like, or rather like complementing, as you were saying, Chirag, is that like, it just completes that circle. A lot of the questions that were getting uh, uh, like not answered, be it because of fit, be it because of like, uh, fabric or like, textiles or like, apparel as a product is a very tactile product. So you've got to like, touch and feel it to be able to build that consumer trust. Now, as we've been opening stores, we've been seeing the conversion of those uh, products um, like, almost like 85, 90%. As someone comes in, they try a product, they see a product, they have already been educated about it online, and that's what got them to the store, but their conversion and their brand trust is a lot higher uh, when there's a physical space for them to experience a brand. And then they can go back into a digital cycle as well and do a repeat order, as I was mentioning earlier. So I think for us, um, having an omni-channel presence as a D2C brand was like, a very uh, strat a strategic decision and it was like something that we had planned for, but doing it at the right scale is really important. I see certain brands try to get in and like just have a pop-up or something that's good to kind of get a product market fit to understand your consumer, but eventually you do need that reach digitally to be able to know and get enough touch points as to where to open a store, to get those data points in, to be able to really understand what fits are working, to be able to also communicate your story. It's often easier said and done through an ad to be able to communicate your story, but then when you come to a store, that's when someone gets to experience the product and have it, make that brand their own. So I think on that personal journey, on that personalized front, uh, our stores, as we've now opened three and we have a lot more to open across the country, have become experience centers for those people who already love the brand and uh, they really like come in with their families and we've seen on a typical like weekend like men coming in and buying like four to five pants and the like basket size just being far higher than it would be online. I think online you'll try a brand, you'll order one product, even in beauty I'm sure they'll order like one product but at a store when they get to swatch it, when they get to sample it, people are buying a lot more products. So similarly over here, people are spending like half an hour, which on a website, someone would spend like five minutes max. So when you have half an hour and that attention, you're able to like communicate your brand story a lot more in depth and for the person to really build that trust, as well as then they go out and become your ambassadors. You're less likely to tell someone that you've just spent like 20 minutes on the internet versus going to say, hey, I just came from a coffee or I was like in Bandra and I went to the Pan Project store or like you got a coffee there and you're like, hey, I just want to check out this cool store. Can you come with me? And so even like through word of mouth, building that through brands, people want to like now experience this on the weekend. Uh, and you can see this in the mall culture that's uh, like spreading all across India right now. People are going to malls just to experience the D2C brands. And I think that's been a really like 
heartwarming phenomena for our industry, like and for D2C as a community overall. If I move the conversation now to Sujata, you you guys have been doing the store business for quite some time now, and you have presence across cities as well in the store business. Uh, but you have a deep digital presence with your brand as well. So what makes you open a store in a specific place and what does that do to your digital business? I've also heard from speaking with you in the past that people are actually okay to buy more as well as more expensive products in store. So what happens when you open a store? So a um, couple of things. So we do a lot of research in terms of uh, not just the online research of where we are doing well and then open a store, but we also do exhibitions, uh, physical exhibitions, and then realize that, okay, there is a huge demand and people come and thank us saying, hey, thanks for choosing our city and coming here and, you know, um, doing, selling, showing the products I can touch and feel. Of course, like you said, people want to touch and feel and then buy. Um, also, the one thing that a lot of people might not know that um, out of our 12 stores that we have, uh, three are our own stores, Coco, and the rest are uh, Foco models. So the franchisee partner just invests in the look in the layout and uh, the rent, but the rest, everything we take care of. And hence, what makes that is that uh, there is no, not much uh, you know, pressure on our head and also that we are profitable from day one. So um, that's one strategy that we have taken on this offline journey and we've realized that Wherever we have opened the store, our combined sales have, are going up. And also, uh, we've realized also that it takes at least um, a two years time um, for a person to actually, for, for a store to actually see the potential. And every year, the store only grows, as you said, like word of mouth and uh, people start talking about it. And also, we have realized that it's so difficult for word to spread. It's just so much clutter, not just online, but offline also. Here, store is open, there is open, and then, Somebody online buying saris for like six years, they come and say, hey, I didn't know you have a store in Bangalore. Hey, I didn't know you have a store in Delhi. You know, things like that, we're still here. So even with a lot of communication, I feel stores take a lot of time to become popular and also people to realize, oh, Suta is there or, you know, like your brand project is there. You know, the, for that, that to happen, it takes a lot of time. So on retail is a very, very slow game offline. And uh, uh, we need to show a lot of patience, patience and also it is because it's a lot about uh, experience, uh, it has to be like a constant work to improve the experience of a person coming in because the AOVs are the completely different when it comes to something somewhere when it's 4,000, 5,000 rupees, offline will be like somewhere around six, 7,000 rupees. So there's a lot of difference, when, especially for our, uh, I think for, I'm, I'm not sure for you, but it's a huge, huge difference. So uh, that just shows that if somebody's educating and talking and educating the customer well, they would, they're ready to uh, buy and spend that much money. So yeah. Uh, yeah, our session is absolutely buzzing because Hitesh Bhai has come in for a short second. The man behind this event. Thank you, Hitesh Bhai, for gracing our presence. Now, you can't leave till the panel is over. No, I'm kidding. It's fine. Uh, and, and last question goes to uh, Pratik. Uh, look, I think we talked earlier about how large the online market for BPC is and how fast it's growing. But still, 70% is offline, right? And so, as a brand that um, is new age, how do you view that part of the market? As we were walking in, you were saying the beauty hub of India is still Bombay and Andheri where all the big beauty brands are coming, coming from, right? So talk to us about how you view offline and I promise you guys this is the last question. After that, we'll open it up to questions for you guys to speak to our panelists as well. Yeah, so uh, look, keeping all uh, frameworks aside, uh, my assessment of BPC cosmetics especially is business is happening in two places. It's Instagram and malls in India. The entire flywheel of awareness to consideration to trial is happening in these two places. So it's imperative for any brand, any new age brand to win on Instagram leading to brand.com and winning in malls of India. For us, the journey started much quicker than the other brands because we already had House of Masaba stores and it made a lot of logical sense when we launched Love Child to put out a unit inside those and we were pleasantly surprised with the results uh, and the second thing which some of you have already mentioned is uh, the PNL uh, or CAC of uh, offline is better from the very beginning compared to the structures of e-com and quickcom so basis the encouragement we got with love child from our house of masaba stores we quickly went on a journey since last year on offline now 
the biggest learning there for me has been that uh, location is the king. Uh, in mall, which floor? Is it the beauty zone? Uh, how is the footfall? Is that the natural direction in which consumers are moving inside the mall? Uh, one metric that I obsess for is uh, the rent to revenue ratio in each mall that I'm present in. Uh, over time, we believe we have cracked that right rent that we are okay to pay and the revenue that it's supposed to generate. Other cost are uh, beauty advisor, which are pretty much standard across the country. So, and the kiosk model also beautifully allows me to do both, bring the brand story to life and also get sales. Uh, we are intentionally avoiding the deep end of uh, GT right now, which is those standalone uh, in North, they say Chudi Bindi stores or cosmetic stores. At some point of time, maybe next year, we may have to look at some of those. But currently, our offline ecosystem, which is House of Masaba stores, uh, the kiosks in the top malls of India, that seems to be the right approach, both from a PNL point of view and from a brand building point of view. Like some of you already mentioned, we get comments whenever we launch a new product, which is my nearest uh, you know, kiosk where I can go because shade matching is a huge problem in uh, cosmetics and the women in the room would agree. How many times do you go wrong when you are buying a shade online and then you get into the return and exchange loop? So. For us, the kind of AOVs we are seeing in kiosk, the overall revenue and the time they are spending is significantly higher. Uh, that's my single biggest growth lever for the next six to 12 months. Uh, I see the revenues of the website part of the business and the mall kiosk part of the business uh, coming very close to each other, maybe in another 12 months from now. Uh, of course, you can't ignore the other part of offline, which is departmental stores. So we do have a presence in the likes of Shopper Stop and Health and Glows of the world. But like I said, the PNL complexity is similar to uh, e-commerce. The, the margin structures, the unit and the other cost rates are uh, sometimes a bit challenging, I would say, for a new age brand, like all of us have new age brands. Uh, I see the traditional behemoths do a much better job, but uh, uh, for me, it's gonna be a lot more on winning in malls with the kiosk format and uh, House of Masaba stores uh, for the next 12 months. So, uh, you know, I hope that answers. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Pratik. And I hope all of you enjoyed this session as much as I did. We talked about cutting through the clutter in the new age brand ecosystem. What are winning strategies for our brands across food, uh, BPC and apparel, which are obviously the most, the three most competitive spaces in the D2C world. We talked about innovating on product, innovating on supply chain, marketing strategy, and then eventually finding the right GTM in the offline space to actually increase your touch points with the consumer. Um, it's been an amazing panel. Thank you all for your insights. Before we wrap up, I actually wanted to open the floor um, to the audience. If anyone does have any questions, feel free to raise your hands. We can get a mic to you. We have about seven to eight minutes, so we'll have a few questions, maybe two or three. Um, I see the gentleman there in the blue shirt. Is it possible to get him a mic? Otherwise, you can just ask your question since it's a small room. So you can go ahead. I don't know, I don't think they have a mic. So it's, it's all of you are using brands, but you're used to online metrics. When you start going offline, what are the key metrics that you start looking at from the offline world that try and at least match up to the online world overall? Sure, maybe you can have one or two of you answer that question. Yeah, go ahead, Chirag Bhai. I think uh, uh, I, my answer will be custom tailored to a business like ours, but I'm sure everyone will have their own challenges. Uh, since online is more so about retailing to a customer and offline is more about B2B, I think the metrics that you need to understand and analyze are going to be dramatically different, curated to your industry, curated to your business. As a business in food and gourmet food products, one critical metric that we look into for our offline business is a value per outlet. We uh, don't necessarily take a lot of pride in being available in a lot of outlets. I think uh, a lot of businesses uh, don't necessarily understand that the more outlets you are in, the more messier it will get if you don't control it very well. One metric that I track across all cities is a value per outlet and see if a particular outlet is growing or degrowing. 
if they are degrowing and it's something that we can help to fix we will definitely go ahead and make sure that all our partners are making enough money they're happy with us their fill rates repeat rates and stuff like that which ultimately contribute to the value per outlet uh, metric to me that is the most critical thing i mean i would be very very uh, comfortable seeing that our partners are growing uh, that will ensure that we are growing of course then there are things like repeat rates fill rates uh, uh, lead times uh, as a matter of fact even uh, you know the turns of inventory that we are doing in a particular quarter or a year we'll look into that but for me uh, i would say one of the most critical metric would be a value per outlet and every other metric that influences that number eventually got it do we have maybe you want to go add ahead add something yeah. over here is like um so we have um so there's a couple of other things that also might be interesting one is to just understand what is your holding period of your product like when it's a it, when it's a, a product that's perishable like ours for example you you need to understand like how long is it staying with the distributor how long is it staying in the store before it actually gets sold out and at the time of purchase like who's actually buying it with how much shelf life still left on the product how does that vary from e-commerce to retail because that has an impact on how the customer feels when they're looking to purchase it i think that's one that's really interesting the another one that is slightly less relevant to us but I, i know it's come up for like a whole bunch of other people which is sort of like your cost of financing so like if your retailers are going to take really long to pay you or if there's like a cash collection cycle that's a pain you know on the back side i think you might want to factor in maybe your your cost of working capital as part of your costs of running you know something in offline it's just in case that's relevant to anyone i think i think one last uh, thing which we are learning uh, but could be important is uh, the portfolio assortment in all offline formats what we are noticing is different even the assortment between a kiosk format and a store format is very very different basis customer profile probably so we are now realizing not to launch with the entire catalog into uh, these formats and get into some of the inventory issues that uh, you guys already covered uh, it's horses for courses we we launch with what we call our cat a or best sellers and then we watch it very closely and then we take stock out put stock in consumers also in cosmetics expect expect more fresh uh, inventory in stores i literally get backpack images that you know i am not going to purchase this because the expiry is whatever so uh, a lot more focus is going in understanding the portfolio at a format into store level and the aging should be minimized as much as possible i think that's from a product point of view but from like a consumer point of view uh one of the assumptions is that like everybody is on the internet but the truth is that there are a lot of people who are not comfortable making a purchase on the internet so all those conversions that you can get of organic people or people who would not have converted or had not received your like communication and to be able to actually see so like visibility whether it's on a like road front or not or in a mall and like those walk in so all those organic tractions are things that you would want to calculate and like definitely like measure because those are all additional data points that you would not have received otherwise Awesome we have time for one more question if there is one more question else we can wrap up the panel I don't see any more questions so that's all we have oh I see one more question okay go ahead know about us and then we work on that you know because your entire marketing focus can be directed towards that you also um, so there's also a, um, you know we we keep checking that the customers actually happy seeing the stock to does it need change so we listen to the thing that they asking for something and it's not available constantly if that happens means there's something wrong with merchandising that we are doing you know and there are there th- actually just just listening to the customer makes solves the whole thing you know the 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 store will be a good store or a bad store uh, if you know if you know that the 10 customers have walked out uh, not satisfied and you know that there needs like changes in every place it product it could be your marketing to reach reach out to them um or it could be um maybe the price if you know they are defining it expensive that means the product range again has to change so yeah a couple of things for us as well just like bridging the gap between like digital and like physical because the truth is that like you get a lot of data digitally but you don't 
always get to show as founders the same data of the store. And so I think that's very important to see how can that qualitative data be quantified in a more cohesive, like, uh, MIS tool way. Uh, and I think that would be very uh, important. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys, for being a patient and amazing audience and engaging with our panelists and keeping them going. I hope you guys have learned something from the session. Thank you to REI team for hosting us again. Uh, we always love to come back here every time. So thank you so much and have a great rest of conference. <laughs>